I want to introduce the next speaker, Sean Ellis, um, and their talk, The Mega Study Approach to Behavioral Science. Uh, hi, uh, I'm Sean Ellis, and I'm a research project manager at the Behavior Change for Good initiative. Which button advances it? Ah, there we go. Okay. So, in uh, uh, the last uh, decade plus, uh, the application of behavioral insights to public policy has spread across the globe. Um, now, this policy advice should ideally be based on field experiments, but uh, running field experiments requires huge fixed costs and is slow. Uh, even when we have field studies to look at, uh, comparing effect sizes across studies is like comparing apples to oranges because no two studies are uh, measuring the same objective outcome. Um, and it's not always clear which behavioral insights are actually robust uh, because of the replication crisis, which we heard about earlier, as well as because of the file drawer problem. Uh, there are lots of studies that have been run that found null results, and uh, they were never published, so we don't actually know that null results were found. So what's the solution? Uh, at the Behavior Change for Good initiative, um, we have come up with the mega study. A mega study is a very large field experiment in which smaller sub experiments are run simultaneously with the same dependent variable. Uh, where uh, a traditional field experiment might test a handful of different ideas or interventions, a mega study will test anywhere from several to dozens. Uh, and the benefits of this is that uh, it allows for comparability. Um, of results across studies, so we're comparing apples to apples. Uh, it lowers fixed costs uh, because there's a single central organizer um, that is helping to implement all of these different studies. Uh, it reduces the risk of learning nothing uh, useful from a field experiment because we were testing uh, many things at once, which also helps to eliminate the file drawer problem because since we are finding some um, you know, significant results, we are able to then ensure that all our null results are also published. Um, you know, this can kind of be run as a, a, a tournament by bringing together in interdisciplinary teams from different fields uh, so that we're not just testing the ideas in you know, one discipline and getting the silo effect. Um, mega studies also allow for uh, behavioral phenotyping, right? So we're not just going to find out what works, but we're going to be able to drill down and see why it works and then for whom it works. And lastly, mega studies um, can vastly accelerate the pace of scientific discovery because instead of running uh, one study after another over several years, we're able to uh, run several studies simultaneously. Uh, so where um, might this new tool for testing many ideas at once be most useful? And uh, one of the most prominent topics over the last few years has been vaccination uptake. Uh, so uh, before COVID-19 vaccines even came out, um, there was a large chunk of the US population that uh, simply wasn't interested in getting any. And, and so why? Um, it's been uh, you know, a massive scientific accomplishment uh, that we were able to create COVID-19 vaccines as quickly as we did. Uh, that's only half the battle because we need people to actually take them. Uh, so that's with uh, my remaining time today. I'm going to briefly discuss uh, two mega studies that we ran uh, where we uh, tried to increase vaccination uptake. Uh, our first uh, was with uh, Walmart Pharmacy in uh, kind of the early months of the pandemic. And we were trying to increase uptake of uh, the annual flu vaccine. Uh, and we did this with about 690,000 pharmacy patients. Uh, in this mega study, we tested 22 different text message uh, strategies. Uh, some of these were we asked, uh, we text patients and we asked them to commit uh, to getting a flu shot. We told them to get a flu shot uh, to protect family and friends. And we also told them that a flu shot uh, was reserved and waiting for them. 
Um, what we found was that all of our 22 text message interventions did successfully and significantly uh, increase uh, uptake of the flu vaccine relative uh, to the business as usual uh, holdout control, uh, so folks that didn't receive a text message. And we found that our top performing intervention, um, which we had an initial text and then three days later a nudge, um, was our waiting for you language. Uh, and that invoked a sense of ownership over the vaccine and uh, possibly even a sense of loss for people if they didn't um, go and get their vaccine. Uh, and so some subsequent uh, studies by uh, Heng Chen Dai and Matesh Patel found uh, that this messaging also applies um, to the COVID-19 uh, vaccine. Uh, so um, we were interested uh, with the rollout of uh, uh, the new uh, COVID-19 bivalent booster this fall to see if we could build on um, this successful intervention and see if we were able to increase vaccination uptake even higher. Uh, this is a um, very uh, recent study of ours where we partnered with a large uh, pharmacy uh, chain in the United States. Um, and uh, the central question that we kind of wanted to see that built on top of um, the waiting for you language was whether or not uh, offering free rides to and from um, the pharmacy to get a, a vaccine added value, right? Uh, and the reason we were interested in this is because uh, small transaction costs, uh, like the cost of having to take a Lyft or an Uber um, or the bus, um, can matter a lot and can prevent someone from actually going and getting a vaccine. Uh, we also know that vaccine accessibility has been a widely discussed challenge, uh, so much so that uh, there were large investments um, in mid to late 2021 to provide free rides uh, to folks so they could go get the vaccine. Uh, we also know that those who live further from vaccination sites are less likely to get vaccinated. So um, in this mega study, uh, we randomly assigned about 3.6 million um, pharmacy patients uh, to one of nine experimental conditions, eight treatments, and a control, with our um, you know, key uh, outcome variable of interest being uh, the receipt of a bivalent booster uh, within 30 days um, of getting their first message. Uh, and so in addition for uh, kind of our baseline waiting for you uh, message, we also tested the free lift ride. Uh, for some other patients, we informed them that they lived in a county with high COVID infection rates. And uh, for some others, we provided resources to combat misinformation. Uh, now what we found uh, was that, again, uh, kind of like our flu shot study, all of our uh, uh, text messages significantly outperformed our holdout control. Uh, however, providing a free ride to and from the pharmacy had no added value to our baseline. Um, our top performer, um, and to others, however, did. And the top performer uh, suggested a plan uh, to go get vaccinated. So the day of the week, the time, and the pharmacy where they last received their vaccine. Uh, now, the next thing, kind of uh, going back to what I mentioned at the start of the um, uh, talk, uh, you know, running field experiments and especially running uh, mega studies, they're time intensive and they're expensive. Um, so, what if we could just get, you know, uh, lay people or experts to predict which of the different intervention ideas we come up with uh, would best perform? Because if they are good at predicting, uh, perhaps we don't even need to run uh, any of these studies. And what we found was that uh, lay people um, vastly overestimate the effect um, of these interventions, uh, and they're poorly calibrated to determine which interventions would outperform others. And uh, we found the same uh, with experts, that they were also poorly calibrated, uh, but they were a little less um, you know, extreme in their overestimation. Uh, one of the other uh, strengths I had mentioned early on about mega studies was it's not only that we get to uh, determine what interventions work, but what interventions work for whom. And so for this uh, COVID-19 bivalent booster study, we found that our interventions um, you know, had a stronger effect on men, um, older patients, those who had already gotten a uh, COVID-19 booster, and uh, patients on Medicare. 
Um, so really the uh, uh, key takeaways we took from this particular uh, mega study was that forecasters, both lay people and experts, um, anticipated that the free rides um, intervention would outperform all others, uh, and it did not. Um, and they're also poorly uh, calibrated and over-optimistic uh, about um, our interventions in general. Uh, we also found uh, some new communication strategies um, that appear to be most promising, um, and all three of them are a type of personalization. Um, as I already mentioned, you know, suggesting a, a plan with the date, time, and location matching a patient's uh, last vaccine, uh, communicating that infection rates are currently high in a patient's county, um, and then also sending the message on behalf of the patient's local pharmacy team. Uh, that brings me to uh, just kind of wrap up. Um, mega studies, uh, as I've briefly demonstrated, can accelerate scientific discovery, uh, compares apples to apples, reduces risks and fixed costs, and can facilitate interdisciplinary collaboration. In uh, the two mega studies I briefly touched on, uh, it was economists, psychologists, statisticians, computer scientists, uh, medical doctors, and pol uh, public health experts uh, that all collaborated on the studies. Um, and mega studies can also lead uh, to policy recommendations uh, that are better than what we can just generate uh, based on scientific intuition alone. Uh, mega studies, however, do have limitations. Um, they're more difficult uh, than most field experiments uh, and often more costly. They require tremendously large sample sizes, uh, which can be difficult to get a hold of. Uh, they require centralized coordination, which means, uh, in many cases, uh, a staff to actually run these. Uh, and uh, there's also some statistical complexities to estimating um, and analyzing uh, you know, multiple uh, and dozens of uh, uh, treatments and interventions at once. Uh, you know, most prominently, uh, what's known as the winner's curse, uh, that you can overestimate uh, your top performing, um, which also then has an issue at the bottom half of interventions of underestimating your bottom performing. Uh, thank you. And uh, thank you to our team scientists, funders, staff, and partners. Do you have any questions for Sean? Hi, uh, John King, National Institute on Aging. Uh, what are the couple some of the advantages of some of these things? Is the fact that you can sometimes take advantage, as I believe in the pharmacy study, of information in the system already about individuals. So, for example, you're able to report out instantaneously that Medicare was a predictor of taking up the thing. Which, well, one question is, is whether that's a proxy just for age. In other words, do you, if you look the, does it increase like the the risk would, which is one point. Um, but another point is, is that is your system there able to actually implement sort of fancier designs like adaptive designs? You find out that you know your bottom eleven are low, all losers, and so you might as well re-randomize people to something else, or, or as it goes along. And similarly, using factorial designs, I'm like, trying to think of ways to sort of you know get tamp down the total end you need here because it. You, the great thing is you've got almost perfect power. The, the bad news is that you pound some of those into the dust. <laughs> you need, don't need to know that much. Uh, no, yeah, we're actually um, kind of looking at that for future studies of uh, uh, being able to uh, kind of like analyze data in real time so that exactly like you said, uh, for um, interventions that just aren't performing, uh, we could then re-randomize people to the interventions that are so we could better power them, uh, which would be really important in you know, studies where we don't have such a, a large sample. Okay. Thank you, Sean. Thank you.